Hour 2 Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Azio, Doug Jeff O'Neill, Jonas Siegel of The Athletic, Leafs Flyers tonight on TSN Radio, also on TSN 4. Mike Johnson down there with a the call. Johnny will join us here in a few moments. Jays continuing their spring training. Some tough injury news today. Keegan Matheson later in the hour, but Jose Barrios getting the ball opening day. Uh, I think we all would acknowledge if Gosman was healthy and ready to go, he'd probably get the ball opening day. But it's kind of a cool story, Barrios. After what happened game two in Minnesota, is this Schneider saying, hey, we want to prop you back really? up? I think it's great that he would be the first, the opening day starter. But I kind of got a weird vibe about the start, like just the the injuries, and it's like you wanted everything to be perfect at the beginning of the season, and you're like, it's kind of a mess a little bit. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, let's call it what it is. Yeah. Gosman is... Manoa. Manoa. It's, it's just... It's, and now you got Romano and Swanson. Some tough news today in terms of what's going on. You see the wounded Jays board up on TSN. Manoa, Gosman, Romano, Danny Jansen's wrist injury. It sounds somewhat significant. Joey Votto, who's not even officially a part of the team, but he's rolled his ankle. Do you know what the cronies would call this? Regression. Regression based on injury. Interesting. I don't even know if that's actually a thing. But it would injury. be with the staff. But like basically last year, didn't they have one of the healthiest staff Absolutely. Like ever? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, no one was hurt? And Manoa wasn't hurt. So it's regression you're perform. referring to health-wise. Yeah, I don't actually think it's the right word, to be honest. But no, it's, it's basically like... proper. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know. It's basically like they were so healthy and yep. possibly healthy last year mm -hmm. that they're just bound to not be healthy. That's what is so concerning. And what's crazy about pro sports and baseball in general, we had Anthopolis on yesterday, and Alex said, it's so different, This getting through six months mm -hmm. and then capitalizing you know on that in the playoffs like the six-month grind it's just it's exactly the way he described it you got to get through it and hope you're standing yeah. and then if you're standing then you're like all right we got like three weeks here let's play ball like let's just throw everything else we have at it let's try to get this thing done everything breaks our way we're going to win the world series but you got to get to the finish line and a lot of it is gosman's hurt manoa didn't break camp uh oh vladdy's banged up well, and that's What's why last going on year, with Jansen. Now, what are you going to do with that second catching position? Last year feels like such a waste for them. They had health. Yeah, their staff was immaculate you, almost. On didn't use their health yeah. in the playoffs, especially right. Right. Yeah, you're right. And even like Bichette was healthy for the most part. Vladdy was healthy for the most part. Springer played. A, I, I looked today. Played a Springer lot of games. Played 154 games. Played a lot of games. Really? There's a, a guy that I would look to scale back and say, we want you yeah. to play a lot, and maybe doing it every day is not the best thing for 100%. you. 100%. But they kind of need him, but they right? they need his offense. I get it, but... Especially in the outfield. They just don't have it. Like Varsho, what, everyone taught him he hit a then. bomb it seems today. like he gets injured running around and jumping uh, I around. I know. I know, but they need him. Like, you need Springer. That's uh, He's going to lead off for them again yep. this year. Like, it's... that's you, You've paid him. You've invested in him. Was it year four now, I think, for him? And... He's he's got to be a catalyst for you. He's got to be because he was a big part of the problem last year. He did not hit well enough, nope. and he did not move the chains. And then all of a sudden, that led into Vladdy and Bo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Keegan Matheson Matheson will join us later in the hour. Um, Least Flyers tonight. Interesting story out of Philly. Sean Couturier is a healthy scratch. So we got into this a little bit in the last hour, but for context here, Philly's reeling. Like they they are reeling. John Tortorella got suspended for two games. You were at the game down in Tampa. The officiating was was terrible, but he's yelling and screaming, and then he won't leave the bench. It was an, you knew the league was going to react to that because it's you can't have a coach say I'm not leaving. Like you you cannot have that. Players they'll treat differently. The coaches have to understand, and most of them do. They represent the league more than they represent like the players' association. And as I said, there was no response saying, let's do this for Torts, and then he goes and scratches the captain. Right. Garbage move. And Couture Couturier was announced the captain 34 days ago. Mm -hmm. Garbage Which move. Which even the timing of that is kind of strange. Like, why so late into a season that you would make that call? Can I read you guys a stat before you bring Mike on? Yes. These are the seasons since Tortorella won the, the Cup in 04. Out in round one, out in round one, missed the playoffs, out in round one, out of, missed the playoffs, out in round one, lost in the third round, lost in the second round, missed the playoffs, missed the playoffs, out in round one, out in round one, out in round two, out in round one, missed the playoffs, missed the playoffs. I feel like all this stuff with him distracts from the record. Like, it's always the Tortorella show, but we mm -hmm. never actually look at, like, what's happened. Right. 
You know like what I mean? Like since 04, which is 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Has not been a championship coach. And yet, like, it's always noise and always this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't know. He, right. he always says, I don't want to make it about myself. But, it's but always, sometimes it's always about he it. always brings it it's back to himself where it's like your words yes. are not matching up with your yes, behavior. Yes, exactly. Man. Yeah. All right, here's uh, Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst down in Philly. What do you make of that decision by Tortorella tonight, Sean Couturier being a healthy scratch? Yeah, I mean, you guys kind of summed it up. It is, it's, it's a bold move, bold strategy, Cotton. I mean, mm-hmm. it, like, I get it. It's not like Couturier has been playing great. So, like, but that is fair. Torch will spin this as it is merit-based and that he's not playing well. But he's also the captain, as you mentioned, just named a month ago, coming off two years where he's missed time with his back. Like, it's not, it makes sense he's hit a bit of a wall, perhaps, after 40, 45, 50 games. But you got a lot of work through it. He's the captain. And you think playing against Toronto – with all the Toronto media here and all the that entails, like he knows exactly what he's doing. If he does this against Columbus next week, it's not getting the same kind of attention, but he's getting, you know, a lot of play on it. And I guess that's what he's banking on, that there will be, he is trying to have sort of like an unsettled response. Um, not guys angry, but just sort of everyone being unsettled by the decision that they play faster and harder. And he's going, we're going to scratch Gary Onoff and Atkinson and Mark Stahl and Sean Couturier, four veterans and just dressed four younger players, some of whom you never heard of, thinking we may not be as good, we may not be as experienced, but at least we'll be faster, and maybe that will help them. But it's, it, it's, it's a risky proposition. And unless he's had a conversation with Sean prior to saying, hey, listen, if you, your back flares up, your body's getting tired, we will do this. We'll manage it this way. But that's not the case, because even as Sean Couturier was interviewed this morning, he was pissed off. Like, he the last comment he made was something like that. I'm not real happy with how I've been treated the last few days around here, which doesn't sound like a guy who was on board with his plan or okay with the decision. Sounds like a captain who's a new captain who's, who's missed at the whole, the whole situation. So I don't know, maybe it's desperate times, desperate, desperate measures. They're just trying anything, but it, it does seem peculiar that you do it against at least one of the better offensive teams in the league. Johnny, where are you at with the blown lead? It seems like there's some people in this building, one sitting beside me that wanted to make it the earth is falling. And no, it's just not what I said. You know, Hazy brought up a good point yesterday. They've had a 13, two and one stretch. And it's so been, nothing can go wrong. Hang on a sec, Jonas. We respect each other's uh, speaking around okay, here and we let fair. each other finish our thoughts. Like, is it the, the, the world is ending for you, Johnny, or is it just one of those nights where they pissed away an, an extra point? No, it's, it's, it's not surprisingly. I'm probably somewhere in between the both of you. I mean, I think it's worth noting that whatever it is, 42% of the games in the NHL have had the team losing at some point win this year. Not in the last five minutes, which I think I've read was, you know, about that. You know, it's happened nine times this year for the Leafs that they've given up a tying or go-ahead goal in the last five minutes, and it's cost them X number of points. And that is something they have to clean up, and there are reasons behind it. But I think the reality is, if I'm going to take this as sort of down the neutral lane, the fact that they're in the position to win so many games is a good thing. And nobody wants to blow the lead. But if you look at their record with the lead after two, it's still really whatever it is, 23-2-2 two and two or something. Like, it's not like it happens all the time. Even though every time it happens, it feels like it's, you know, it's, it's more frequent. Um, and the other part about it is I think that if you're going to have a discussion about, okay, what lessons can be learned, there's two things to me. One is they don't have, like, lockdown forwards that they love. And I think that's a conversation, whether it's a penalty kill or a six-on-five, like they don't have sort of, I guess David Camp is the closest thing, but wingers without yarn croak around, they don't really have, and I guess Martyr either, they don't have sort of defensively really reliable wingers. And the other thing is then, what's the situational awareness for the other players you put on the ice? Can they appreciate, okay, late in the game, we're not, maybe, maybe you don't try to, to score that game-winning goal. you got to make sure you don't give that game-winning goal up. Like, I would have that conversation about the Leafs roster right now, more so than this is an issue that's going to plague them, a huge problem. But there are, mm. you know, there are some things that it's probably worth investigating. Yeah, th- that's happened a couple of times, going for the empty net, and it burns them. Like that was- Well, and I think the other night they didn't actually go for the empty net. Right, against Carolina. But I think the week before, was it Marner that Marner, chased yeah. it down? And then, you know, it was before you know it, they're going to overtime. But, yeah, I, I think, listen, we, we're going to have these conversations about the Leafs naturally. I think what we lose sight of is that it's happening everywhere else in the league. Florida has wards. Boston has wards. 
you know, Philly's in a playoff spot right now, but they're clearly not in the same category as the Leafs, and the Leafs have a different history, and they have different expectations and different style of game and style of players. Um, but I guess what we were asking earlier, Johnny, is like, is it too late in a season to expect anything drastic to change by now anyway? You know, like, is, is their penalty kill just bottom third in the league and that's it? And their issues with the wingers defensively, that's it. Like, I don't see how Sheldon Keefe and company, what are you going to do between now and a month from now that's going to drastically change anything? I don't think anything. No. I mean, any, any work that's been done, any new players that are going to arrive, that, that ship has sailed. Um, obviously, he's going to try to coach up relatively inexperienced players. I mean, again, I kill penalties in my career, and, and I watch the penalty kill, and I understand what they're trying to do. It's just not always executed properly. And... Part of it, I think, is they don't have like this non-instinctive for the players they have, you know. And you try to put McMahon out there or Neil Ander out there, and um, you know, it's it's just not in their nature to to do what you need to do. So you're right. I, I think this is just sort of their their roster. And as you mentioned, everyone has flaws. Leafs for sure have flaws. Um, doesn't mean that they can't win series. Doesn't mean that they can't go deep. But it does mean that that is something that Sheldon Keith has to be aware of and try to mitigate as best he can. And how do you do that? Well, one, I mean, the penalty kill thing is, is tricky because killing, killing, um, you, it's going to be hard to implement a whole new system now. They try to do this pressure points on bobble pucks and on puck retrievals, and, and if they don't get it, they get themselves in trouble. I don't know if you can change that drastically with three weeks left. Um, as far as the mentality late in games, I do think there could be a conversation about how are we approaching how we're playing late in games. I think there could be that can be a work in progress, but no, I mean, this is the team. This is the team that's been good. They're going to get 100 points or right around it, and they're going to be good in the playoffs, and, and we'll see if they're good enough. But I think the reality of losing the O'Reilly's and the Acharis and, and players like that that were stout and reliable defensively has left, has left a hole that hasn't been entirely filled. Johnny Matthews has slowed down, and, I mean, he's still on pace for, according to Jonas, 68.5 goals, <laughs> which was a hell of a season. If you were going to put in three nominations for the Hart Trophy right now, today, who would they be? Mm -hmm. I would give it to McKinnon, comfortably and easy. I would give it to, <laughs> this is probably Kucherov. Uh, although Kucherov defensively, defensive the game is Who was terrible, that player again, know. Johnny? Kucherov. Don't okay. worry, Mike. He mentioned the defense. Defense thing, doesn't right? count. He hedged. Doesn't matter. He's hedging, Johnny. Thank hedging. you for repeating the, the player. And your third okay. player is? I think I put Matthews because Matthews' defensive game has been ex excellent. I think this is the part where, like, I'm going, like, Kucherov's offensive game has been so exceptional. I guess I'm sort of giving him a bit of a pass because he's been on the ice for more goals against than any player in the entire league this year, which is not what you want for the most valuable player in the league. How valued can you be when you're almost out of the playoffs? I can hear Jonas right now in like, yep. thought bubble. I'm He's not even reading it out loud. He's got it. Yes. But, um, but I, I think, and then Austin, I mean, if he gets upwards near 70 goals, even though Connor will have 30, 20, 30 more points, Austin's going to have 30, 40 more goals. I think that's enough to make a wash for a better defensive player. Like, and then, and then Connor, and then, I don't know, Pasternak and Hellebuck would be the other guys. But yeah. the Kucherov one is fascinating because the reason why Tampa is being successful is because of power play, which he runs. Like you do deserve credit for being good in the power play. That is part of the game, even if it's not on five on five productivity. He, he is the reason why that thing goes as well as it does, and that's a big reason why they're going to make the playoffs. You can't take that away from him. He's a winger, so even if he's good defensively or bad defensively, there's only so much impact that he has. And I'm acknowledging he's not very good defensively, um, but I just. I'm giving him on the strength of the goal differential on McDavid, and the points are going to be about the same. And then I'm giving it to Matthews for the goal total and the defensive impact. Yeah, and you look at Kucherov in Tampa; he's got he's got 41 more points than Braden right. Point. Fairly significant. Like that's pretty massive gap. And that's Number also that was the all was 42. It, yeah, exactly. and he finished sixth in the league in scoring that year. And somehow won. Paul did. Yeah, well, that yeah. was narrative driven because of it 100%. was the team. But I, that's I would suggest it should probably apply here with Tampa too. They're the second wild card. That's what uh, New yeah. Jersey was. I think they were eight. I Isn't think it, it was just still... okay to say Kucherov put the team on his back and got them in. What's yeah. wrong with that narrative? I, I dude, you have to preach to the people. choir. You have to pick. 
Yeah, you it's get, McKinnon, Kucherov, and then the debate is who is Last third. Last I checked, I'm the only one of you, you guys who That's has a ballot. Valid, Jonas, <laughs> and that's a problem with society right now. <laughs> pathetic. It's that's a serious. Pathetic. It, that explains our issues with society right now. Yeah. Oh, and I don't have a vote, <laughs> and you do and have do a vote. I. Johnny, yeah, me and, Johnny doesn't. Me either. and Hayes are treated like circus clowns. Everyone that subs in on this show votes on everything, and we're just a couple of circus clowns. <laughs> are just space fillers before the experts show up and let you know how you're wrong. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. We're Kramer at the Tonys. We just we fill seats, and that's that's how we operate. Just um, fill the jacket. Yeah, exactly. With Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst, leaves Philly tonight on TSN4, also on TSN Radio. We were discussing this last hour, like the the marketing department. If you if you're running the league. If you're running the NHL right now, and it, it's your job to try to boost ratings and market everything you can possibly market, you have these two options for the second wild card in the East. The Detroit Red Wings or the Washington Capitals. Who would you pick and why? I would pick the Detroit Red Wings because as a market, Detroit, Red Detroit is such a monstrously strong market. You look at those out-of-town ratings when... The home team's not involved in the game, right? So when it's Pittsburgh against Washington, where else in America is watching? It's always Buffalo 1, Detroit 2. Yep. And I think Detroit, the, like, original six franchise, the league is in a better place when they are sort of relevant and a, and a, and a decent team. And Washington, while well, I get Goldie's there, and, but chasing the, like, oh, Washington's no good this year. I, I'm like, even though they're in the playoffs, I barely consider them a playoff team, which is strange to say. And Ovi's not scoring 40 this year. And the fact that he's chasing down Gretzky, he doesn't have relevance in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not excited to watch, you know, whatever, Strom and McMichael and, and Ovi and, and Rasmus Sandin go to work. Like, I think just Detroit as a market returning the playoffs after a seven-year absence, one of the, seven, the second longest behind Buffalo, mm-hmm. would be a better story and a more revenue-generating move than, than Washington. Yeah, I, I think either. I mean, there's no doubting that in terms of what the market represents. Uh, I just I look at the star power Ovi. I didn't think he'd ever play. Yeah, but Kane's not a Red Wing though. Like it's he's not. I know he's there, but he, he jumped on late. I don't think of it as like wow, Patrick Kane and the Red Wings. But like, do you think dude, like you a marquee guy? Of course it is, but not as marquee as Ovechkin. But do you think like you'll actually be like, man, I gotta watch Ovechkin tonight. I don't know that he you doesn't will. sell for you. He like he's old. Like he, I get it, but th- that's I guess I guess this is the issue the NHL has is that Ovi and Sid were the marquee guys forever, like the equivalent basically of LeBron and Kevin Durant or LeBron and Steph Curry. In the NBA, they're not sitting there saying, "Give me Minnesota." I got to get them in there because you know it's like, no, give me Steph. I want to see Steph play. I don't know what I'm. This is going to come to an end at some point. Yeah. And yes, that applies to Kane. As well, I, I didn't think I'd see him play in the playoffs again, although he did last year for New York. But Washington missed last year. I thought they'd miss this year. I still kind of think they might. But the idea of Ovechkin still playing in the playoffs again is pretty significant. It is. And b- any player that you're mentioning in this breath is not the same they were 10 years yeah, but ago of course or 15 not. years yeah, ago. But all those same guys, with Steph, so you're getting a LeBron. totally different player. All those guys are still really good. In the NBA, you're saying? NBA, they are. Right, yeah, but Patrick yeah. Kane's not up for the heart either. I mean, let's not pretend like Kane's still showing Don't you agree that Steph Curry could win his series? Kind of. Like he, yes. Yeah. I don't know if he, he did last player. year. He beat Sacramento. But he's right, but Ovechkin can. No. But that's the difference between basketball and on hockey, right? Exactly. It like, doesn't matter how you could put whoever, Connor McDavid, on the Washington Capitals. They're not going to win a series. It right. doesn't matter. So, like, that is the difference. And you can tune in to watch Obi play, what, 19 minutes and get two and a half, two and a half shots a game. Like, it's, it's just a different thing. And in fact, the NBA is probably like, you know what? I wouldn't mind seeing Anthony Edwards go in because the world needs to learn who that guy is. I know Jeff O'Neill's on that bandwagon, yeah. but everyone else got to get on that bandwagon in a hurry. So I don't know. I, I think like it, it, it's been even this year with him chasing Gretzky Hayes. It feel it's felt like a quiet season around Washington. Like it doesn't feel like there's a lot of hype around Obi at all. Maybe mm-hmm. because he got off to such a slow start. But we get he's an all time all time great player. But the, the 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 star has dimmed to a degree this year, where it's like it doesn't. I don't know if he moves the needle to the same degree as Detroit, the franchise, Mike going back to the playoffs. Mike, I'm curious how you think about the new changes that it sounds like they're going to implement for video review, where it sounds like they're going to kind of expand it a little bit. Do you like this? Do you think it's like puck got, over glass? You're saying yeah, and high just, stick. Yeah, 
That's what it sounds like. To I think the, to clarify, if if there's a puck over glass call, the team will have the ability to challenge it. But if they challenge it and they get it wrong, it's a five on three. It's ludicrous. But yeah. <laughs> what okay. If, what if a team screws up? The ref screw up and they it like hits the mesh and it's found that they screwed up and it hit the mesh. What's the penalty there? <laughs> well, there shouldn't be. Uh, well, I guess my stance would be. Uh, you know where I feel about this. Just eliminate it, it all, Johnny. Just I'm just jumping on. Make it work. I, I would get rid of it all personally because yeah. I don't like any of the review process. But the, this, the game has stopped already to begin with. The puck's out of the play. Yeah. Why do you need to do the goofy coaching challenge thing? Just have some guy in the booth say, actually, it hit the glass. Don't worry. Like, why do you have to go through the yeah. challenge? But if you get it wrong, it's five on three. Like, Dude, that's I think the whole iPad things, stuff. and I heard Greg Millen talk about it. The iPads and the and the TVs on the bench, I think they should all be gone. Fine, Sorry. exactly. And if you do that, then let the league figure it out. If it's, yes. a, if it's a puck over the glass, but then it turns out it wasn't, yeah. let the NHL then, determine. Because the, the play has stopped at that point. It's not like you're blowing the whistle dead on a breakaway and getting it wrong. The puck is gone. The yeah, play has right. stopped. Who cares who challenges it as long as you get but it right? But even the players, the players looking at the iPad, it's just for like vanity reasons. They're like, Oh, you could have passed it to me there. Look at this right here. It's yeah, just like it what? is self-serving. No play is the same. Move <laughs> on and get your ass back out on the ice. It's so stupid. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, standing there, like some guys grab the iPad every time they come off the ice. I know, like, literally every time. Because they, they want to see they, how cool they look or how somebody it. didn't get them the puck. It's ridiculous, how close Johnny. The chance was or whatever. I know. Like sometimes. They need to sit down and say, I didn't see that. Okay, it, it may be an actual teaching tool, but that seems like it's 10% of the time. As far as the review thing, it's one or the other, Hayes. Either gas it all, like forget all review and just let the rest of the ice call it. They're right 99% of the time. Or I have zero problem adding a self-inflicted high stick or a puck over the glass to your reviewable thing. Because I know standing there, I'll go to our ace truck. I'm like, hey, did that hit a stick on the way over? And in three seconds, I have the video that shows, shows, no, it did not hit a stick. It's a penalty. Yes, it hit a stick. It's not a penalty. So if I can have it in three seconds, because it's already a stoppage, as you mentioned, it will take no time off the clock. I, like, I don't mind ones like this. Or whose stick hit that guy in the face? Was it the teammate? Was it his own? Was it the opposition? Again, it takes two seconds, and it's very, very black and white, yes or no, and it's easy to decide. I'd much rather, if you're going to have review, have ones like this that take two seconds, you get the right call, however you get there, whether it's league-driven or team-challenge-driven, you got the right call. It's the ones like goal interference. Like, you don't know. Yeah, like, it's, it's an subjective. interpretation call where you're like, I can watch it again. I saw it in real time. I'm just watching the same thing I'm making a judgment call on. You don't know. But the ones that are not subjective, they're, they're, they're just clearly mm -hmm. yes or no. I don't mind because they're so fast. Like, literally, the game should not be delayed any longer than it takes to get a new puck and get down to the face-off circle to drop it. To have that kind of challenge, so that's how fast it can be. I agree with you. I guess my and I don't love reviews, but if it's going to happen, my point is why force the coach to make the call and then waste time looking at the process? He's got a different angle than I someone's know. got. I know. And, oh, it's like you're in the penalized NFL, more. Isn't it uh, like the last two minutes? The yeah, the, the booth, booth takes just, over exactly for something yeah. like that. They can just say, "Look at the right. you, you look at the penalty box. Hey, what is it? Was it good? Okay, it's good. We move well, on. Why is one penalty and worth the, reviewing and another's not? Well, that's and another like, question. Exa exactly. That's another and, good and question, is, but. And the good part about these ones is even if the league flips the call, no one's going to be mad, right? If you got high stick with you, by your teammate, you're not going to be like, how do we not get a power play there? Like, because you know you don't deserve one. Right. If the puck deflects off a guy's stick, how do we not? Because you don't deserve one. No one's going to be irritated to league just flip the call and got it right. Isn't right? there like, bigger no fish to fry than this? Like, well, this is what happens at these GM meetings. I know. It's right. like, we should do something. Yeah, yeah it's like, what, what are you? They get seven gin and tonics in them, and they're like, hey, what if we did this? What am I, four up on the front? <laughs> By the way, what do you think about Buck over the yes. glass? <laughs> like, what? Justify the breakers for a week. Yeah, exactly. Oh. What do we do? 20 aside, what's your number? By the way, what do you think of uh, Puck over the glass? <laughs> like, it's so ridiculous. All right, Johnny, enjoy it tonight, buddy. We'll do it again soon. Speaking of, speaking of four up, Hey, have you turned into the full swing new season on Netflix? It's I really haven't good. seen it yet. I saw the it's first really season. It was good. great. Really good. I watched. I, I binged it in like a day and a half. It was yeah, really good. I'm all over it, man. I'm all over it. I'll give you the update later in the week. All right, boys. See you, Johnny. Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Check out Maple Toyota's huge truck and SUV lineup, including Tundra, 4Runner, Highlander, and Grand Highlander in stock and ready to deliver. Visit mapletoyota.com. All right, at least Flyers tonight. The belt. What's going to happen with the belt tonight? I might have a choice. If I'm good enough, I'll retain it. If not, I'll distribute it. It's going to go somewhere else. But it's mine to... Oh, so Duffy's not making the call. No. I get to decide. And wow. I would 
probably likely say, I'll retain it. Yeah, I would assume. I mean, why would you not? So the quiz tonight, you're back. Last week, you had it with you down in Tampa, right? So the belt was not Yeah, the revealed. keeper of the quiz belt. People around the pool were calling me. Yeah, I saw My that. friends that I was chatting with. You were chatting with them? Yeah. Were what you like, they? hey, what do you think this belt is about? Did yeah. like... Were you I gotta tell quiz? you, I that's a reasonable conversation. That guy just jumped in the pool and was. I gotta tell something. you, I had to do that a couple times on two different days because one was wrong. And after the second time, a guy comes up to me with the mustache and goes, "I have to ask you something." I said, "Yes." He goes, "What the hell are you doing, jumping in that pool <laughs> with the luggage with your kid?" And uh, yeah, he goes, "I've been watching that from afar, and I need to know what the hell you're up to." And I said, "Bud." If I told you, I, I don't even know how to. Exactly. Explain. Are you I go, Canadian? All I can tell you is I work in television, and that was a part of my job somehow. Yeah. And that's being sent back to somebody that's doing a television show tonight. That's the only way to explain. I it. wanted to see him the next day and show them the clip of the quiz to see what it was. So right, he, right, right. Because his mind was not at ease. Yeah, because that would be something that would. If you see someone taping something and jumping into a pool, you're like, what all is right, that guy? I'm intrigued by that. I want to know what's going on. Yeah. Why? Why is that guy's not yeah. doing that for Instagram? Right. There's something actually happening here all right man well good luck tonight you guys you guys oh, we're gonna be great we get we got keegan coming up right we're talking burritos hey i gotta ask you and, no you don't i gotta you don't tell have you to ask me nothing man <laughs> ask him the one acting more thing and that was pretty good pretty good i think you deserve a, an award nomination did your kids ever ask you to do one without the shirt on did they ask you to go shirt off and jump in i think if i didn't have my shirt on <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought it looked great in September. If there was no shirt on, that would have been outrageous. Like that would have been Andre the Giant. Yeah, so you look great, point. and the white shirt looks great. Yeah, that's a good look. Okay, get that I think off. You Yeah, unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in. But the cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. There it is, man. JP, he went to it. I didn't call for this. JP saying you look good. Look at the shirt on in the pool, but it looks phenomenal. That's an athlete's jump. Yeah. You were at least a foot off the ground. I had uh, first time in a in a long time tarp off in the pool. You were tarp tarp off. Yeah, you gotta I was be, man. It's a whole was, different lifestyle. I was going into hotel lobby convenience stores and buying the long sleeve neoprene yes. fat man suit. Right. But pretending you're concerned about the sun. Exactly. <laughs> That's what it always yeah. is. And you cake a bunch on your face to <laughs> <laughs> You go Webb Simpson on <laughs> to let people know you're <laughs> deathly afraid right. of the sun. That's why I have the shirt yeah. on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You do a lap <laughs> around the pool area and you show everyone you're caked on. Sun <laughs> yes, your loads. ears are loaded. Everything. Everything. You, you touch the ears. Of <laughs> There's ways of doing it, man. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the shirt. It's no. the sun. People, it's yeah. the sun. You get under an umbrella a couple yeah, times. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, we'll catch you on the panel tonight. <laughs> there he is, the O-Dog Jeff O'Neill. Keegan Matheson coming on. Is he a shirt on in the pool guy? I don't know. Keegan's been down in Florida for a long time. We'll see. Where are we at with the Jays? Barrios getting the ball opening day. That and more still to come. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel. You got Leafs Flyers tonight. The Raptors back in action tomorrow night. The Jays are plodding along down in Dunedin in spring training. Winning ball games, you know, it's everything's all good. <laughs> Grapefruit League, but we're real close to the real stuff, right? Like next week, it is go time for Major League Baseball. I think it's actually sooner that the game's in Korea. Yeah, they're in they're in South Korea. They're in Seoul, right? Yeah. I think it's Dodgers early. Dodgers and Dodgers and Giants, is it? I don't know who they're over there against. I know the Dodgers because I know it's Otani. Yeah. But uh, the Jays are going to start on the road, and obviously they're still you know doing their things in terms of renovations down at the Rogers Center. They got a tough start, like a tough start. But they're at it next Thursday, and uh, Jose Barrios will get the ball opening day. And to chat about that, among many other things, we head down there now and catch up with. Blue Jays reporter for MLB.com, our good buddy Keegan Matheson. How you doing, Keegan? I'm doing well, boys. You're catching me on my uh, my escape from Florida. I'm about to dip out of here for a few days, so this is a uh, a joyous occasion. Beautiful. Yeah, you've been down there for a while, right? How how long have you been uh, in the state of Florida now? Man, February 12, I landed here, so it's been a it's been a minute. So the the, you know, the good news and bad news of today. The bad news is I was already going to be early, and the flights delayed. 
But maybe the good news out of that is that I'm going to put in some uh, some serious work at a uh, hotel bar here. I'm going to get very familiar. <laughs> Attaboy. Bang. Attaboy. Good man. Well, before, well, we won't waste too much of your time, then. Let's get to it before you get at it. Uh, the, the Barrios announcement today, he gets the ball opening day. Um, how much of this is the status of Gosman? How much of it is what Schneider said about what Barrios represents? What happened game two against Minnesota? Like, where, where do you, how do you come to terms with the idea of Barrios getting the ball opening day? Yeah, if Gosman's healthy, it's him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But Barrios, I think, is your easy guy to go to next. And looking back, guys, this was November 2021 when Barrios signed that seven-year extension. Right then, I would have said Barrios 5-6 straight opening day starts. It's going to happen. Um, we didn't see Alec Manoa coming like he did. We didn't see Gosman happening as well as it did. It's been a strange couple of years, but this is where Barrios belongs. And last year, the beauty of Jose's game, I think, kind of got lost in the fact that everybody was consistent. Everyone was pitching big innings. But now I think you're really going to see the value of one guy doing that. To Barrios and Chris Bassett as well. But the Blue Jays need innings. They need healthy, reliable innings right now. It's getting a little nerve-wracking early on already for them. And Barrios is that guy. Uh, he is beloved in that clubhouse. He's as respected as a guy as you're going to find around baseball. It's not hard to find people who talk bad about someone else. You don't hear that about Barrios. So uh, good on him. Uh, I think he earned this with a great bounce-back year last year. And they need him. They need him to be exactly who he's been. Keegan, we were talking earlier just about the pitching staff and some of the injuries last year. Does it just, like, I I said it's almost like regression is just due to happen. Do you think they're just due to have more injuries on the pitching staff than they had last year? And how do they adjust if that happens? It's happening now, I guess. Yeah, it's happening now. And it's, I don't want to call it luck because I need, you know, I need to make sure that, you know, trainers and the work these guys do still gets recognized. But there's some luck involved. Some years you are going to only need six or seven starters. And guys, think of the last two years. 2022, that's the year when Ryu went down. Ross Stripling saved this rotation. Mm -hmm. He just stepped in and was a great starting pitcher. That doesn't happen. Last year, when Manoa went down, they pieced it together long enough and Hunjin Ryu came back. That doesn't happen all that often. More often than not, go back and click on a random season. 2017, 2014, you're going to need 10, 11, 12 starters that's when it starts to get a little more dangerous. So this is where the luck and the kind of reality of a major league rotation starts to come knocking on your door if you're the Blue Jays. You just hope it happens later in the year than this because right now they are already going one, maybe two deep. We'll see if Kevin Gosman's ready for that first start through. But when you have to go a bit further than that, that's when you're leaving yourself pretty exposed. And This is why, guys, when we talked so much, and I know the Blue Jays were were big believers in this lineup bouncing back, that's not enough by itself because betting on this rotation to do the exact same thing, man, that is a bold bet because they were amazing last year and they were extremely healthy. Well, and the Alec Manoa situation is is so, I think, unique to this conversation. Like Gosman, we know what he's done. He's been phenomenal as a Blue Jay. It doesn't sound like they're overly concerned, although it's spring training and things are building up here. We'll see. But let's say he misses a start or two, but he can still find a way to get 28, 30 starts on the season. You're probably going to be happy with what Gosman's going to bring in that situation. Manoa showed up and had to prove he was worthy of breaking camp as a member of this rotation. He started one live game. It was an absolute disaster, and we have not seen him since. So there's clearly no chance he's going to make the team. Like, there's no chance he's starting the year in the rotation. But how far away are we now, Keegan, because it's been such a disastrous spring training, regardless of how we got here, how far away are we from just make, having the discussion that this guy just may not be a part of the plans, period? Like, he may not be able to find it again. He's going to have to win a spot. This is not just about a guy coming back from injury and walking back into a rotation spot. He's going to have to get healthy, number one, which we'll see how that goes. He's going to throw a bullpen and then maybe face hitters later this week. But can he ramp up consistently? And shoulder injuries, shoulder issues are really tricky. I know we focus a lot on the elbow, but the shoulder, man, is a puzzle when it comes to a pitcher, and that gets worrying. So even if he can ramp up and kind of repeat spring training, We're talking about a month, five weeks. These things take some time to build up. But when he gets back, he needs to actually win that job back. 
because he put himself in a decent position to start this spring. But like you said, he went out and hit three guys. He threw a slider off a helmet. He's going to need to come back and win that job. And that job right now is Bowden Francis's. I really like Bowden Francis. A lot of the Blue Jays coaches and even some of the other pitchers really like Bowden Francis. So this is going to be a situation where Manoa has to do a couple of things, not just get healthy, but he's got to come back and prove that this is his job. There's a lot going on there, and it's not as simple as I thought it would be a few weeks ago. No, that's for sure, and that's it. Like I think to prove it, if it's not at the major league levels, we're talking about going back to the minor leagues, which is something he clearly wasn't comfortable doing last year, and if he goes there and it's a mess... Um, I, I don't see how it's going to be rectified. I mean, I, I'd like to see this story. I'd love, I'd love the idea of a redemption story. It just feels so far-fetched at this point when it comes to Manoa. Um, but, you know, we've discussed Gosman. Obviously, Danny Jansen with the wrist injury. That's concerning. But news today, Swanson and Romano also banged up. Like, w- what is the level of concern on their status as we get closer to opening day? Yeah, you're talking about Romano with elbow and Swanson with some tightness in the forearm. Those are... Your two most important relievers, and elbow and forearm are the last words that they want me to be saying right now. You know, th- those are scary things. Now, the good news is that MRIs didn't show anything structural. There's nothing glaring red sirens with this just yet. But you always need to be careful. R- Romano's going to get an anti-inflammatory injection in that, either today or tomorrow, sometime soon. It'll be a few days away from throwing. We'll see how that goes then. But even if this is a best-case scenario, guys, you're looking at maybe this stretching a little bit into the season. We're getting so close to opening day that that would disrupt routines a bit. So I think we'll know a lot more the next couple of days, but those are big names that you don't want to be down right now. And this kind of overlaps with the rotation, guys. If Romano and Swanson had gone down with a healthy rotation, I'm saying Bowden Francis, Mitch White in the bullpen. Easy. Well, they probably have to start games now. So you're looking at Nate Pearson. You're looking at Zach Pop. This stuff starts to snowball, and it gets really difficult on the back end of the roster. That bullpen, just like the rotation, was real healthy and real good last year. But you're seeing that when you do that over and over, these workloads add up. And again, elbow and forearm, not the things you want to be talking about anytime, but especially right now. Well, Keegan, as far as the lineup is concerned, what would be your level of confidence that George Springer can A, stay healthy again, and B, bounce back offensively. He's 34 now. Like, How confident are you in that happening? Yeah, I, I wonder if you even put together the same stat line uh, as last year over that many games. Are the Blue Jays happy? Do you need a bit more? At this point in Springer's contract, there's still a few years left. And yes, a lot of it last year was real bad luck. I was there to see him hit 100 line drives right at guys. That's some of it. But you also need to see that bat speed be there. You need to see the power, I think. And if there's one thing that encouraged me this spring, it was when John Schneider said that Springer was focusing a bit more on pulling the ball for some power. This lineup needs more power, period. Mm -hmm. I, I did not like the narrative last year that this was not a need and that they could string hits together. This lineup is built to hit dingers. That makes a lot of problems go away. If this lineup makes a few mistakes, the defense boot the ball around, but you hit a three-run homer, guess what I'm writing a story about? A three-run home run, probably a 5-4 win. Power is so important to this team. Springer is hitting for a bit more of that in camp here, so that involves taking some more risks, maybe trying to jump on a fastball, and sometimes strikeouts can come with that. But I think a bit more power would be big for Springer at the top of that lineup. It, It all starts with him. He's the leadoff guy period. It needs to start with him, and I think power would be a really nice start. So where are we at with Joey Votto here, Keegan? You know, he, he obviously had the the first pitch home run. He goes an inning. He rolls his ankle. Now he's writing basically poetry and cursive language, cursive <laughs> writing, which is actually phenomenal. His cursive is, like, spectacular. Yeah. Discussing Canadian baseball, his history, past comments on a podcast a long time ago that I'm not really sure why that's at the forefront. Um, you know, he's an interesting cat. He's a really interesting cat, but you've been around him now for a bit. What's the likelihood Joey Votto's got a future here with the Jays? Yeah, everybody wants to be a writer, eh, guys? It's, it's yeah. the dream, even the ball players. Yeah. It, I, I think this obviously stretches into the season. The way I see this playing out is that Daniel Vogelbach makes the team. 
He rides that bench, takes some pinch hit ABs, tries to crush some righties. <laughs> if he does that, great. You ride it for a month, two months, keep it until it's hot. I think that Joey Votto, when he's healthy, will see how this ankle issue uh, impacts him the next few days. But if he can ramp up and get into some games in AAA, and he seems completely open to that. He's taking this minor league deal very literally, and I think he's kind of taking a romantic view of it. He, he sees the story this can be. If he can go down to AAA and prove that he's a guy who can take some walks, and much like Springer, hit for some power, Votto realizes his power started to go away late in his career, and that happens for veteran hitters. He's trying to chase it. You know, he, he's trying to look for that. You saw it, one swing, but then steps on a bat. It, it's been an amazing story so far, but I think likeliest is that when he's good, he goes to AAA and tries to play his way up and knock off Dan Vogelbach from that uh, bench spot. It's not the competition I expected <laughs> when I landed here in, uh, yep. in Florida, my God, but it's, uh, it's what we've got. Keegan Matheson, so you're at the airport down in Florida. You said you're going to belly up possibly at a bar. You mentioned that Votto, all these players, they all want to be writers, and I guess they want to follow in your footsteps because I saw you tweeting about a book coming out. You're writing a book. It's going to be out, what, in 2025? Like, what's the story here, buddy? What are we, what are we talking about here in terms of this book? That's right, guys. It's, uh, it'll be next year, so it's, uh, it's testing my patience as a writer who normally sees all my stuff appear immediately, but... Uh, It'll be out next year. It's going to be a curated history of the team, which I hope means a, uh, a history that's not boring. I don't need to tell every story, uh, but I hope it's going to be a lot of the most interesting stories. So the glory years, recent teams, COVID years, and then some stuff that I've been around for uh, with a lot of these players and the notable guys who have kind of built the identity of this team. So that'll uh, be out next year, be working on it through this year. And, uh, man, we'll see if I survive the season. We'll see how much I've bitten off here, yeah. but... Uh, so far, so good. That's awesome, man. Well, good luck. I can't wait, can't wait to read it. We'll talk to you a bunch, obviously, before it finally comes out. But uh, safe travels. Enjoy the trip home. And uh, we'll do this again real soon. Thank you for this. Hey, you got it, fellas. We'll talk soon. There it is. Keegan Matheson of MLB.com. New book coming out. You got to appreciate that, Jonas. It's right? a lot of work. A lot of work writing a book, man. And covering a team daily. Yeah. They get like 18 days off a year. Keegan is everywhere. He's been in Florida for six weeks. Yeah, he must rack up a lot of points. Though. Lots of points. That's nice. It's always the move, right? <laughs> Everyone that travels, they're like, can I put that on my card? And then I'll, yeah, we can do that. I remember the first few years I traveled, I never did it. And people were like, why don't you have a yeah. loyalty program? I was like, whatever. You got to what have mistake. it, man. You got to have it. The points are massive. Yeah. Massive. By the way, I was just looking up some of their stats from last year. What do you think the total leader for the team was with home runs? Like, who do you think led the team in home runs, and how many do you think it was? Kind of shocked by the number. Yeah, it, well, Vladdy was in the 20s, yeah. so I don't think it was. Was it Bichette? No, it was Vladdy. It was Vladdy at what, 20? 26. 26, yeah. Where are they Where are they supposed to get all this extra power from? Like, well, he's one, obviously. Vogel back. <laughs> but he's a pinch hitter. Justin Turner. He's not going to hit for a lot of power. Turner, I think, had 23 home runs yeah, or something last hit. year. But you're right. I mean, the, the plan is internal improvement. Vladdy's got to hit 40 home runs, and Bo's got to stay healthy and hit 30-plus. He hit 20 last year. Yeah. Springer's never been like a huge Springer's not a guy, guy you think of for power. He can hit home runs. Yeah. He's a great He's leadoff like home run 20, guy. 20, 25? Yeah. Hmm. But no, that's that's. I guess exactly that's why they wanted Soto, and that's why they wanted Otani. That would, would Otani could bring 45 home runs yeah. to the table almost immediately. So, Soto, if he's healthy, he's probably going to hit 35 or 40. But they're not here. So nothing you can do about that. All right. James Murdo coming up. Least Flyers tonight. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right. James Murdo coming up. Our buddy James in about 10 minutes. Least Flyers tonight. Today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble the same game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Least money line tonight. I do not like what's going on in Philly. Just feels weird. Tortorella back, Couturier being benched. They're really starting to melt. The Leafs went in there a week ago and laid a beating on them. And I think that rolls over. I, I know Marner's out, Yarncroak's out. They've got some illness issues. Labushkin's not there. But they're playing pretty well right now. They're winning a lot of games. I like the Leafs' money line. It's not a lot of juice on that. I like Matthews' anytime goal scorer tonight. I like Matthews' four-plus shots on net. That is a parlay paying plus money. There's your best bets 
powered by FanDuel. FanDuel's goal in the first 10 minutes is the most electric bet in hockey and can be included in a same-game parlay on any NHL game. Please play responsibly 19-plus and physically located in Ontario. does feel like Marner not being there has is definitely had a negative effect on Matthews, clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, like, he puts, some on a, he puts it on a T for him. Yeah, he's always thinking of, like, how do I find do this I guy? Find yeah. yeah, and now it's Bertuzzi and Holmberg he's playing with tonight. It's a little harder. Bit of a drop off. Yeah, they're really feeling like the like like you said they've managed well, but no Marner, no Yarncroft, and mm-hmm. suddenly that's two of your top three right wingers. Yeah, Marner plays twenty two minutes a night. Every situation. Every too. situation. Like it's really you're gonna feel that. Yeah. It's yeah, hard. you're you're gonna feel that for sure. But we'll we'll get into that discussion because we had it a little bit earlier in off air as well about you know the the veteran status of this team, the fact that, you know, they, they don't cheat you on effort. They kind of play a predictable style. It's not always great, but it probably speaks to why they just keep plugging along and they've banked all these points and they're going to the playoffs again. And what will it mean come playoff time? Obviously, we don't have those answers right now, but James Myrtle coming up on uh, Leafs Flyers tonight, Leafs Capitals tomorrow. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.